So this well money went to the government. The restitution, the private restitution went to individuals on an individual basis. They went not only incidentally to Israelis, they went to other survivors, wherever they were and so on. Any more questions at this stage? Please. Yes. How much was it really the reparations and restitutions? Because I got the feeling that Germany was and is very good in avoiding paying money and that the amount is more symbolically. Well, here they were in a difficulty in avoiding it, you see. They were in difficulty in avoiding it. It was, would have been very bad, very bad press, very bad publicity, so they couldn't avoid it. I mean, truly, frankly, I think that the German, uh, it was Konrad Adenauer who signed the agreement. I suspect that, um, you know, the people's motives are different. Adenauer said he was not, not, not to be a Nazi or <laughs> something of this sort. But I suspect that he also thought of the effect it will have on world opinion about Germany. So trying not to pay the money or drag his feet about it, would have, would have uh, I think, uh, Germany would have paid a very heavy price for that, not in economic terms. On the contrary, in economic terms, at that stage, it might have given a boost to, to German industry, which is still recovering from the Second World War. We had this great demand for goods, many industrial goods. So I don't think they were trying, uh, for obvious reasons, they were trying to share it. So. But you may know more about it than I. Not really. Sorry, there was somebody else who wanted to talk about this question. All right, and I'll go on with your permission. Now, uh, I want to say something about the evolution of the Israeli uh, political economic regime. You see, Israel had the, uh, how should I call it, uh, had the uh, uh, reputation of being a socialist country. They have to warn, not a socialist in the way in which this term was known in this country. We're never a communist country, and neither politically, not economically, nor anything of the sort. But we were certainly a country with certain basic socialistic uh, principles uh, and institutions. And I want to say something about it because it's interesting. But the combination which might interest some of you. Are there any political scientists around? Not one? <laughs> oh, you are all right. Uh, so uh, you are what's called a free listener. So you don't come for this purpose. But anyhow, uh, I think it's interesting. What happened was that uh, uh, for that, we have to go to the pre-state period, to what I call the Yishuv. Yishuv was the, which means settlement, was the name given to the Zionist uh, uh, population which came to Israel either out of ideology or because they were not allowed to go somewhere else. I mean, immigration, Jewish immigration from Europe to Israel, to what's now Israel, to Palestine, went up very much in the 1920s, where the United States uh, started restricting immigration from Europe. People who otherwise <coughs> might have immigrated to the United States came to Palestine. Simple as that. <coughs> Some of them had mixed motives, and it's not, e not very easy to classify people. Why did they come? When they came, and so on. You know, when they came, you know, but why did they come at the time when they came? Anyhow, at that time, you had a number of things. You had a, somehow a com combination of ideological views and real life necessity. And it was a fascinating combination. You see, the country was ruled by a British administration, was basically a colonial administration, which means that it intervened very little in the economy. Very uh, so uh, now at the same time the holy land was very holy but it offered very few attractions to investors at that time very few it had no uh, no real uh, <coughs> natural resources except for the Dead Sea and the potash which, was on the potash, uh, which could be produced from the Dead Sea uh, and so it was to attract investors for purely economic reasons to the country and that was a very serious problem. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> if you want to absorb people, you have to have some investment. There was some investment. It was mainly in housing and in plantations, in, uh, in citrus groves, uh, which uh, used little labor and mainly preferred Arab labor, which is perfectly all right from the point of view of the employers, but created a problem if you wanted, if you needed in order to absorb more Jewish immigration. That was the, uh, what was the main idea of the Jewish political establishment at that time. Palestine. So uh, there were capitalists immigration looking for employment. Now what do you do? And here there was a, a it, there were two things. There were non marxist socialistic ideas and there were some Tolstoyan ideas, ideas, you know, back to the land and things of this sort. Uh, so that gave rise to the development of what used to be one of the sort of pearls in the Israeli crown, 
they collected settlements, the kibbutzim. Which many of them are not collected any longer, but for many years there was something which is much admired all over the world. There were people working together, sharing together, and so on. So, which is partly or mainly done, there was an ideological, how shall we say it, oiling of it. Uh, but it was mainly done for practical reasons. It was the only way to find employment for people. For these people, if they, went, if they banded together and made, made, managed somehow to eat it out together. The other thing is, which was really extremely interesting. Well, there were people in the workers' movement, in the labor movement of the day, who had outstanding entrepreneurial abilities, but had a social, psychological, ideological aversion to become business people in their own lives. They were not interested in profits. And they started to develop some business enterprises to provide more employment for their, friend, for their comrade workers. And it started with a... a group of people who started an office for uh, accepting, looking for jobs in building roads, and then organizing committees of workers who would take a part of the, work, of the works. And if they did not hand over all the profits to these workers, it was only to increase to, to find out some other job of the sort. They did not take the profit to themselves. So at some stage in history, you had this sort of group of highly motivated, highly able entrepreneurs who were not interested in doing money, making money for themselves, but rather for creating employment and income for a large number of uh, uh, capital-less uh, 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 immigrants. And I'm, I'm talking about the 1920s and 1930s, because that's where the development took place. Now, uh, they created a number of things, and I want you to have a look at that. Sorry, this is the wrong thing. Uh, as we've seen already. Right. Here we are. Now, they created a number of things. One was the Istadrut. The Istadrut was really originally a trade union. But uh, trade union is all very nice when you've got uh, some employers to fight with. But if you don't have employers to fight with, what do you do? So, you see, in Israel, it's important to remember socialism did not mean nationalizing industries. It meant building industries. Building them in a way which was in the eyes of those who build them socialistic. One can debate that, it's beside, beside the point for a moment. So the Stavrut developed, the trade union developed a huge thing. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, it was at the same time a trade union, really, because there were some employers, some private employers in the country. <coughs> and it also owned business concerns. They reinvested all their profits, not necessarily each concern separately. They were, there was a holding company with all the profits went to that holding company, and that holding company never divided uh, dividends. It used that money, sometimes in the margin for political clout, but mainly to reinvest, to expand, and so on. Uh, it ran a sick fund, the Istabrut, which covered more than three quarters of the population, which in a country in those days, that was before, before the national health scheme even in Britain, and in a lot of uh, European countries, that was quite an achievement. Uh, it uh, operated schools and cultural institutions, it provided an organizational framework for collectives and, and cooperatives so that they could share some of the problems and have some common purchasing committees, you know, purchase or, or purchasing uh, firms to purchase, let's say, fodder for the cows or whatever. Uh, and they were a dominating component of the semi state institutions of the issue, which uh, really paved the way for the state of Israel later on. Now, sorry, what I would like to stress is that. The thing created also a lot of tensions. It wasn't so simple. First of all, their great moment came during the Second World War. You see, originally, this what's called the Workers' Company, that was the, the name really of it, of the Holding Company, went twice broke, frankly. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. But what really saved them was the Second World War. First of all, they were extremely, their great power as a, as a producer was in, in, in constructing, in building, in construction. And that includes road. And the Second World War uh, created great demand by the United Kingdom, by the British armies and some other armies as well, for roads and airports all over the Middle East. And they were very experienced in that and got a lot of that work. And that work was paid without much consideration for, uh, for uh, rentability. When, uh, in the middle of the war, Ministry of Defense uh, requires a road being built, they will pay whatever. Usually, what's called the cost plus. You say, What were your costs? And you got this um, addition in a 
uh, for the profit. And they made a lot of money in that. And they were looking for new things to invest in. And there, at that time, the, 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 the industrial plants which developed in the, Jewish, in the Jewish sector in Palestine, which was very small, remember, by 48, it was 800,000, the whole population of the whole country included about 150,000 uh, Arabs, was 800,000 people. So uh, uh, they developed, uh, some of these plans uh, got into difficulties uh, at the beginning, just before the war, because I have to remind you, that was the time of the Great uh, Depression. So uh, industrial prices were very much depressed, imports were, were cheap. The mandatory government did not try, like to protect industries because it affected negatively the rest of the population. Uh, so, because prices would be higher. So, uh, to protect with the sales or something. So, so uh, many of these firms uh, were in a bad situation. And then it came exactly when this workers, uh, <coughs> sorry, corporation, amassed huge sums of money from building roads and, air and, air and airports and so on, and they invested in these factories. And bingo, just after that, the fighting in North Africa started. I don't know many if you know the, the, the terms of something where Rommel was stopped from <coughs> advancing into Egypt. Uh, and there were huge demand. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. There was a huge demand by armies for anything which could be produced by light industries as well. So if you produce tents or you produce uniforms or anything, textiles, whatever it was, uh, uh, tinned goods, everything went. And they really developed a very large industrial uh, I don't want to say empire, that's a bit, uh, but uh, industrial estate in those years. So they became really a dominant uh, factor, socially as well as economically, in the pre-state, uh, pre in the pre-state, semi-state institutions, which provided the basis for a state when the time came to establish a state. And lots of the institutions were already there. That's the important lesson which can be learned from that. The question was, what type of economic regime? Now, there was this memory of the Great Depression, where if anything didn't work, because the capitalistic system did not deliver. Not deliver, it's supposed to deliver, did not deliver. And that's, that's the, the great, uh, uh, how should I say it, uh, factor in favor of the capitalist system. There are many arguments against, but one thing is it delivers. It delivers the production, delivers employment, and so on. But it didn't deliver in the period between the two world wars. So uh, there were some reservations about that. Uh, there were also the remnants, and not only in what became Israel, uh, in many other parts of the world, of the war economy, where, uh, for pretty obvious reasons, uh, a lot of things had to be rationed in order to provide the goods which the army needed, in order to provide the uh, consumption of the public needed, food and so on, had to be rationed. Market mechanisms could not, could not work in this situation. Uh, neither could the work incidentally in the early years of preserving the mass immigration and so on. So, uh, and some people even thought that perhaps this question of rationing and price control and so on is also socially just. We're all in the same boat, let's all have the same. Uh, and it's, it's not an argument which can be very easily dismissed, except that it doesn't work very well. But uh, this was the main, main so you had the the, the effects of the interwar period, uh, you had the uh, failure of capitalism, as I said, a heritage of direct government intervention from the Second World War and its aftermath. The greatest, uh, the most uh, uh, severe rationing in Britain was not during the war. It was in 1947, where they had a problem. It was a very heavy winter, and they were sending coal to Germans so the Germans won't die from, uh, won't freeze to death, despite having been defeated. Uh, and uh, simply there was no, uh, the restrictions were even greater uh, on consumption than they were during the war. Uh, 